Well, good afternoon. Last week we began a, a segment for all of you just to uh, take care of our uh, social isolation. We're now into social isolation for the 26th day here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, it gets to be a little bit tough when we don't interact. So, uh, today I have with me uh, via Facebook uh, my best friend Tim Pellish. Uh, Tim and I, we have been together ever since first grade, and uh, Tim is very special to me. Uh, and even more importantly, Tim is like a brother to me. And so I, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And uh, today we just like to talk about on our, our little uh, episode today on priests and saints of the Passion and uh, Easter Tide. We want to talk about Monsignor Johnny e. Boyle, and we'd also like to talk about uh, you know uh, Saint Thomas, uh, Saint uh, Doubting Thomas, Saint Thomas. Marianne, Tim is over here. Oops. Okay. Sorry about that, Tim. Uh, all right good so uh, sometimes Marianne gets a little bit confused and she can't tell the difference between people so so but anyway uh, Monsignor Boyle uh, was a tremendously large part of Tim's in my life uh, in essence he's probably the the only priest uh, that Tim and I had known for the first 30 years of our lives. Uh, he was around for our baptisms. Uh, he was based, He gave us all of our sacraments, right, Tim? With the exception of confirmation. And uh, we were there uh, during our adult lives with him. So he was a very special part of our life. And because of that, we just today would like to talk just a little bit about Monsignor. Uh, you know, from my perspective now as one of his seminarians and as a priest, uh, St. Patrick's in Pottsville was uh, very proud to have in the seminary for many, many years, ten guys all throughout the eight years of formation. And that was a huge chunk of Monsignor Boyle's time in his pastorate. And I remember Holy Thursday when we would go down to the Chrism Mass. We would all pile in his station wagon and he would drive. And then at a certain point during the dinner with the priests and the seminarians, Monsignor would come and he'd grab the ten of us and he'd take us on tour. And he'd take us to all his priest friends and he'd put his arms around us and he'd say, These are my boys. But Monsignor in his own Irish wit was also showing... Uh, their noses in it because they didn't have 10 seminarians and he did. And as I said, that was a huge part of Monsignor's life. Yeah, what's interesting about that too is an altar server, and I hung around with all the seminarians, as you know, back in the day, and I used to go to the prison mass with Monsignor and you guys. And uh, one of the things I always, I always said, to, and I, I talked to you, Bill, uh, Monsignor O'Connor, and uh, Bill Campion, is how you guys love the liturgy. And I think each one of you, when I said that to you, all three of you said the same thing back because you had a great teacher. And the teacher was Monsignor Boyle because he loved the liturgy and he taught you guys how to love the liturgy. And you could tell that from, you know, and, and he was proud of the seminarians where he, he beamed and with, with, the, with his fellow uh, priest, how honored he was to have all, the, have all you guys in the seminary one time. Though. But I... He loved the literature. He did. You know, there were there were some people because they never understood him, Tim. But there were some people that always thought that he had an air about him where he was always gruff and mean to people. Yes. But well, that's what that's what he liked. That's what he liked about you and I, Bill. You know, you and I would talk normally, like like we're talking today. Everybody feared him because he was like he was like a, he was a uh, a staunch figure. I mean, he you know, and he was a big to do. In the city, he was. You know, but he liked us because we talked to him like we talked to our dads. We were, he liked chatting with us on a friendly, joking way. He had a great sense of humor. Great sense of humor. Yeah, um, I think the only time that he ever really was very serious 
was, as you said, you know, his love of the liturgy, which he wanted to convey on to us. And I think that was one of the reasons why so many guys went into the seminary, and then even guys that didn't go into the seminary, they're still very actively practicing, and their children's and their children's children are actively practicing. You know, when I think of what he expected out of us when we sang in the boys' choir and when we were on the altar with him, you know, he wanted perfection, but yet he was always there to oh, teach you what to do. Yeah. You know, he was. And lesson after, serve, after serving mass as an altar boy, he take you out and show you how to hold a chalice, like with respect, you know. Uh, but he's very, you're exactly right. He was, he was focused and he liked the liturgy. And he wanted it perfected, like, you know, and they said, you know, uh, many times after, not many times, but, you know, you take after Mass, like, listen, like, you just hold a chalice a certain way, you know, uh, to the altar and stuff, because like, he, he, uh, uh, he loved, he loved it, he loved, he loved teaching it to us. You know, I loved it, too, you know, um, even before all this trouble with the church, he always maintained the proper boundaries, but I think it was our coming of age when he finally said, do you want to come over and then have breakfast in the rectory with me? Mm -hmm. And just being able to go into the rectory was a big thing. And to sit at that great big table with him was always a tremendous That's honor. Big table, yes. You know, uh, as a priest, and from hearing stories of other priests, you know, especially Monsignor Wargo, who, who he loved, uh, Monsignor Boyle was a priest priest. Uh, yeah. Say, yeah, absolutely. Priest, priest, Monsignor Treston would tell you that. Monsignor Wargo would tell you that. And he was a pastor's pastor also. Yeah, you know, he loved his people, he ministered to his people, but, you know, it goes much more when you have another priest that ministers to other priests and saying, are you okay? And checking up on you. Yeah. And, yeah. you know... Even growing up as kids, some of the priests we thought were, were weird, you know, Monsignor volunteered to take all those guys to try and help them get better, you know, which was always kind of neat. Um, the other thing that is, go ahead, Timmy. Timmy? Just one quick thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, the priest, he knew his parishioners inside and out. He knew his parishioners. And I experienced a lot of stuff with him on a personal level, as we had discussed. Is my dad died young, and my dad died at home, and he had come to our house to give the last rites. But more fun, even after that, we had, the same year we had a house fire at our house, and he the first thing he does is after fire came to my mom and offered us the 504 building. The old lift. Of course, we lived with our grandparents at the time, you know. But he was always there, like for like important functions. But he knew it. He called us, by the way, Lebanese, uh, part of Lebanese. And he was proud of the Lebanese uh, members of his parish, which he referred to us as his Irish of the East. <laughs> he was the Irish of the East, you know. Uh, you know but, but he was uh, just a, a for uh, parishioners. I mean, he knew every parishioner. He knew their personal life. He, he, as, you, as you do in your parish, Bill, is he takes time to learn. He took time to know people. Learn people, whether it's a funeral or a wedding, was personal because he knew you, and uh, he was a wonderful man. Yeah. And, I, and rambling off a little bit is his spiritual life is fantastic. When I became a councilman, I got a beautiful letter from him, and all of us did. We were the first time in a council. We were all Catholics from the mayor to the council. We were all Catholics at the time, and we each got a letter from him. How proud he was of that because he was part of our spirit, all of our spiritual lives. And the only exception to that was Joe Braille. Joe Braille, all of us remember the St. Patrick's, but he, Joe Braille was a member of St. John's. And he mentioned that in his letter, but he was so proud because he was involved in our spiritual growth that he like, wow, he's like, all Catholics on the council, which was unheard of. And, uh, and he wrote that in retirement, by the way, from his, uh, when he was in retirement. He was so proud of that uh, part. He was also a big part of our community, uh, you know, I don't know if they still had it, Bill, but you remember they used to have the religious area, uh, a council of town where all the uh, pastors of the Protestant church and the Catholic Oh, yeah, the ministerium. The ministerium. Yeah, he was great friends with uh, Elmer Davis, and uh, 
He was Pastor friends Al. with uh, Byron Ebling and uh, Al. yeah, Al. yep. They were personal friends, and they met on a regular basis in this town. And they all of them would advise the councilman in the past, you know, on different things like, especially, you know, uh, when the issues were coming with the Capitol Theater when they started showing the X-rated movies, they were a big part of protecting the community there and getting it basically shut down. Uh, he was also a big part of the Tiffany building. If they had a name in Tiffany other than the Yeah, uh, he really was tremendous in, in making nativity a possibility. And, you know, the other thing that was fascinating about him, too, was his creation of St. Joseph's Day School, which is now uh, St. Joseph's School for Special Learning. Yep. But what most people didn't know was that his baby sister was physically and mentally challenged. And that meant a very big part of him. Yes. And so it was a very big part of his life because he was a trendsetter in Schuylkill County in beginning to take education very seriously for these children who were ch uh, physically and mentally challenged. Yeah. And, uh, you know, both of us, when we were in college, we always had that wonderful opportunity with Joe Kelly to make the trip to go open his summer home down at the shore. And the only reason why he had that summer home was because his, you know, little sister loved the beach so much. Yep. So we yep. would go down there and get it ready for her to be able to come and spend time with him at the beach. And one, one humorous story with uh, my senior is, I got back from, I think it was right after I got back from college, you remember this, is the collection the weekend I was home was for the seminarians. Tim, you there? Can you hear me? Uh, we lost you when about the collection for the seminarians. You need to repeat that. Yeah. Okay. Remember, we had the collection for the seminary, the seminarians that weekend. And I put my envelope in. I put a note inside the envelope for Bill Gloucester's use only. <laughs> and you called me all the same as Monsignor called you. <laughs> <laughs> I ran into Monsignor after that. He cracked up laughing. He goes, Probably the most moving things, Tim, too, was the fact that while we were with him for a lot of the good times, he also made sure that he asked you and me to go down to visit him down at Holy Family Villa for priests in Bethlehem when he was dying. Yep. And I remember those trips that we uh, made to go down to see him, and he was so sick and could barely talk, and yet he was always so glad to see us, he had a smile on his face. And, uh... I was just, I was just saying, oh, as sick as he was, the smile on his face, he would, he would, I would walk in that room. And, and, and he, you remember the first time he asked us to do it, he said, please don't think I'm weird, but the only thing that would make me really feel better right now, aside from you both being here, is if one of you would rub my feet. Well, he had that, you know, unfortunately he had that bone cancer. Yeah. And I think that the massage of his feet just gave him some relief. Yeah, well, yeah. the only thing that made me angry with that is the fact that he would always say that my hands were too cold and he wanted you to rub his feet. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was so appreciative of that, though. Gosh, he was so appreciative of that, you know. You know he said, he's turned the back of St. Patrick's Church now. That's where, you know... That's, that's where he where wanted to be. Now. Yep. Yeah, that's where he wanted to be. A very proud man. And proud in a, in a, in a good sense. Oh, absolutely. Like I say, yeah. he loved Potsdam. He loved Potsdam. Yeah. So, well, he... He told me one time, his priest, his fellow 
We just gonna ask him, and he told me this. Why do you love hot stuff? He goes, there's no place like it. That's how you can see it. He goes, there's no place like it. You know, because he loved, he loved the community. He was here. He was running, I think it was born. Was he raised in Jim Thorpe? Or what was it? It was called Mocking Chump at the time. Mm, no, I think he was born down in Philly, Tim. I'm not sure. We'd have no, to double check on that, but. Yeah. 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 But. Uh, oh, yeah, he loved, he loved hot stuff. Well, he was here for over 40 years, you know, uh, but just, just a fabulous man. You know, yep. one of the, the points that we want to do is a lot of times you don't know what a lot of the good things that priests do. And so our point is to be able to try and share some good times and some good memories with you. And, you know, just Tim and I, uh, like I said, we're like brothers, but a very big part of our life was Monsignor Boyle. I want to move on to the, the second part of our uh, show today, and that's talking about saints, uh, saints of the Passion and the Easter Tide. And basically, we want to talk a little bit about uh, Thomas the Apostle today, because this Sunday we'll be hearing about Thomas in the readings from John. But one of the other things is uh, St. Thomas More. St. Thomas More. Uh, is the patron saint of lawyers. He was a lawyer and a very great defender of the Catholic faith when uh, Henry VIII wanted to do away with the Catholic Church to just allow his own particular whims and be able to run by his own particular rules. So uh, even though everybody knows him as Tim, his baptized name is Thomas, and uh, if you would go into his private office in, uh, in his law practice, in his private office on his walls, one wall has a picture of Thomas More, and the other one has a picture of Doubting Thomas. And uh, they're two very special people to him. But, but Tim, uh, maybe you could just share a few thoughts on Doubting Thomas. You know, why you, why you consider him to be so important. And does Doubting Thomas... Do, does he do or does Thomas play some sort of your role as a Catholic lawyer? Well, Th Thomas More, to me, was the first social justice lawyer. You know, he really believed in the protecting people, and I think one of the like, you know our our system, our criminal justice system, is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You're innocent until you're proven guilty. Thomas More was a strong believer of that, and I, I really believe that. You know, I know our system is based off the of, you know. The, the old system, but Thomas More was probably a man ahead of his time because that's what he, he believed in social justice and he believed in that the innocent until proven guilty. You know, turned beyond reasonable doubt to King later, but he was probably the first, the first ever, like, uh, that was wanted to protect people's dignity and rights and make sure they weren't being railroaded, as they say. You know, like, I think we, you and I talked about time, like, uh, you know, our system is a great system, very few innocent people are found guilty, and very few guilty people are found innocent, you know. And uh, Tom Spore is very strong about that. He was a very, uh, uh, with his faith, um, he really, really believed in, 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 the, in the, the system that was uh, was fair to everybody that came before. It came, no matter what your wealth was, but fairness to everybody. You know, you know Tim, one of the things that I found really interesting was uh, Henry VIII had a great deal of respect for Thomas More and he threatened to put him to death and all he had to do was recant and say you know I'll do whatever you want me to and Thomas More refused to do that because his faith was most important and Thomas is More's youngest daughter who was the love of his life Henry VIII sent her to his prison cell hoping that when he saw her, he would say, okay, I'm willing to renounce my Catholic ways, and uh, because I love my daughter so much, I love my family so much, and he gave her a hug and kiss and sent her on his way, on her way, and then he was beheaded. And so he put, he even put his faith over his family, but he realized his family was his greatest gift from God, and what God provided, he needed always to take care of God for that first. Yep. As a matter of fact, you know, you gave me, uh, my, when I graduated from law school, and I have that home, my bedroom is 
the actual statue of St. Thomas More from you. I have actually a statue. We have, the picture, have portraits here of him, but I have the, uh, the statue of him at home. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Thomas the Apostle, right? as you and I discussed that one, Bill, that's my favorite gospel. And that's a gospel to me that can be preached every Sunday, you know, because I, that, that reflects our faith, that reflects the Christian faith to me, you know. Uh, doubt it, you know, I won't believe until I see it, and uh, until I touch his hands, I touch his ribs, you know. And when uh, Jesus appeared to him, obviously, uh, you believe because you saw me, you know, hope, blessed are those who don't see me and believe. You can preach that every Sunday as far as I'm concerned. That's the gospel every Sunday. True. Yeah. I told you, that's my favorite. Yep. I used to have, uh, you remember Phil Bent before the... Uh, I do, very well. I do, very well. Yeah, Phil was a great guy. He and I discussed this gospel. We were not the week after Easter. I'd always run into him. And he just looked, looked forward to it because I could get into this. You know? Because like I said, it's my favorite. That's it. It's my favorite gospel. You know? And, uh... But I think that could be preached every Sunday. I think that's the gospel. That's our faith to me. You know, and one of the nice things, too, is, you know, the gospel ends with uh, Thomas looking Jesus in the eye and saying, My Lord and my God. And a lot of people will interpret that as his profession of faith or maybe his moment of shame that he did not acknowledge God. But, you know, I like to maybe look at it as more of a prayer of gratitude. Because when you believe in Jesus, he takes all your doubts away. And we need to be grateful for that. Yep. Yep. And I, I said, I, I don't think his faith was shaken or his faith changed. Because he was a follower. He was a follower of Jesus. But he didn't realize that it was happening at that time. That he was going to rise from the dead at that time. That's where his doubts were. Like, wow, was this happening now? Yeah. Because he was being taught, you know, as a follower and an apostle, that this was going to happen. And I think that the fact that he wasn't present when it happened, like, really, this happened now? You know, I think, like, he, that, again, where we get the doubting Thomas from, right? You know? And uh, it, I don't think they, they expected it to happen when it did. No. And we also know that Thomas's name... You know, in Aramaic, is Didymus means twin. And even though nowhere in the scriptures do we ever meet Thomas as twin, but you've heard me preach on this, I like to put the spin on it. Maybe we are Thomas's twin, and we're called to pick up where he left off. Yep. Yep. But anyway, that's the, that's the, that to me is the gospel of our faith. I just always felt that. You know, I told you that all the time, by the way. Oh, yeah, well, and you know how I listen to you, too. Yeah, uh -huh. So just, just do that gospel every Sunday now, okay? Okay, I will. <laughs> and, you know, I remember that, you know, of uh, our little group, you are the most special and uh, the most intelligent and, uh, yeah. yeah. Who's making the honest living? You are, Tim. You are. Exactly. So, well, Tim, thank you for spending a little bit of time with us today, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks guys. God bless Tim. See you, see you guys.